Uh, I've been a performance tester for 15 years, working all over the south of England. Um, coming for me today from your beautiful, beautiful New Forest. Um, so uh, I'm now working as a site reliability engineer, um, but uh, over 15 years I've done all the roles in testing from manual to automated um, to, to lead responsibilities, um, but mostly uh, I focus on performance um, and um, automated performance test lines, uh, pipelines. Um, and because uh, I come from a bit of different backgrounds than performance testers, so I've never done, done the consultancy route, I've always been integrated within teams, so either within a QA team or within a dev team or within a wider DevOps team. Um, I've got a unique experience where uh, I've been, you know, working for a long time uh, trying to look at the holistic picture um, and building automation um, and work very close to those other teams. Um, so trying to, you know, contribute across the board, not just within performance. Um, uh, as Ashley said, uh, we do have a Slido uh, set up. Um, please do that, put your questions in along the way. Um, what I'm hoping we can do is, I don't know how many questions there will be, um, but I'm hoping um, we can, um, you know, put the questions in, have a little vote, um, and then I can prioritize the questions that are of interest to most people. Um, but yeah, I'll try and leave time to get through as many questions as possible. Um, and uh, do feel free to reach out on um, LinkedIn afterwards um, if you've got any, any follow-up questions or you want to do networking or, you know, any of that sort of fine stuff. So excuse me a moment, I'm just going to start my timer so I don't ramble on um, past our allotted time. Okay, um, so there's the, uh, the Slido link. I'll just read it out briefly. So 42304, um, and I'll give that link again at the end um, for anyone who's interested. Um, so, um, today uh, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, I'm afraid it's not going to be a live Minecraft demo. Um, I found that's too distracting. Um, there's too many things to go wrong. Um, so, is this going to be a Minecraft theme? Hopefully that'll still be uh, interesting for people. Um, but there's going to be a little story. Um, and we talk about pipelines and architecture. Um, then we're going to get to the meat of the metrics and statistics. Um, and then we'll wrap up and we'll do the questions. Okay. So. You're in the honey business, um, but your team's decided, you know, collecting honey by hand isn't very efficient, it's getting a bit old. You've heard about the DevOps revolution, you're all on board, um, and they've built themselves a farm. Um, so that's a really good start, um, but obviously, like any good project, you're going to want to iterate on this um, because you're going to want to um, make improvements and bug fixes, um, but hopefully you're adding features and you're picking performance fixes um, and scaling it up to more customers over time. So there's going to be some iteration. Um, so you're going to want that DevOps pipeline going and you're going to want to retest. So, you know, the old world of where we develop software, um, we test it afterwards, and then, you know, before you go to a live performance test, um, you, you know, get consulting, someone does something manually, they review results, they give feedback, you go back to, uh, go back to dev. Um, that doesn't really work anymore because teams are pumping out new releases too quickly. Um, so we're going to want to build some automation so we can run performance tests um, with the rest of the pipeline um, and keep up um, with today's, you know, hectic pace of development. Um, so going to do pipeline. Um, so like all good CI pipelines, we're going to have a build step. Hopefully you've got a, a test stage. Um, so, you know, you're already running unit tests, um, integration tests, you know, maybe some functional tests with the or something like that. Um, I recommend you do those first before you run a performance test. Um, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, we want no performance is good before you run all the tests. Um, but performance tests run at scale, it causes a lot of confusion. I strongly recommend that you get your ducks in a way first, to make sure the application is functionally complete um, before you start running performance tests. Um, so, yeah, so you spot run, so you're running performance tests in your pipeline. Uh, and then performance tests pass. Uh, and you push to production, maybe you've got multiple production systems, maybe you've got uh, beta systems that you go to first and you do a stage pipeline. Um, so there's lots of tools for doing this, um, you know, but I just wanted to mention, you do want to have a pipeline, you do want to be following DevOps best practices. Um, I see a lot of teams that try and sort of shove this together with Bash, um, you know, you'd have custom installers, they copy files around to get the serve deployed. Um, you know, I'd, I'd strongly suggest if, if, if you're trying to run performance tests and you don't have a way to deploy your application automatically, you've got bigger problems and you probably want to focus on that sort of focus on that part of the business first. 
Um, so, you know, you want to look at tools like Chef and Puppet um, or Kubernetes, um, that sort of thing. So you can get your pipeline and you can promote the software up uh, through the stack automatically. Um, also, having a quick mention of architectures. Um, so here you've got your lovely scoting user. He's firing load up our lovely a horizontally scalable system. Hopefully you've got an uh, architecture like this. I realize not everyone does. So not everyone is running a microservice infrastructure. Um, but uh, the re reason it's relevant is I just want to say, you know, you want to have a proper monitoring stack. Um, don't, you know, a big anti-pattern for scaling up your performance tests is again, trying to use bash to scrape results off the tests uh, out of the servers. Um, Cause you're just duplicating work that operations or DevOps are going to have to do later or SRE. Um, so try and collaborate those teams, make sure developers are publishing metrics to StatsD or whatever metrics uh, system that you're using um, and, you know, collect them that way. Um, same with test environments. Um, so I often come across, um, I'm sure everyone, anyone who's done performance testing uh, has come across um, environments where some developers want to run some performance tests. Um, they've got a server. Uh, often it's the functional test server that you know is running a VM under somebody's desk, um, and they downloaded some free tools and they're running them from their laptop. Um, that's the thing I see all the time. You know that's not a suitable environment for running a performance test. Uh, you need to make sure that you have servers that have production level specifications. Um, that's why you know having a horizontally scalable architecture is really useful because you can scale the server down. You can scale down the number of servers horizontally to reduce costs. So rather than having eight microservices running, you can just have one or two. Um, and you can scale the cost that way and have a same specification. Um, if you're scaling, if you have to scale vertically, which means that you've got you know really big mainframe data, uh, mainframe servers that have 64 cores for processing. I've got you know two gig two gigabytes of memory, um, and they're really expensive, um, then, uh, you know, often there's pressure to use a lot smaller box uh, for the performance tests on. Um, and, you know, it's only going to get you so far um, because it doesn't tell you that the software is going to scale um, to those number of processes and uses that amount of memory. It only tells you it's going to scale up to a certain, certain uh, load level within a certain size box. Um, so, yeah, st strongly recommend you work with your architecture team make sure it's horizontally scalable and you have a proper spec box. Um, and also make sure that you're running load generators, um, you know, uh, on proper, proper team in the server room, um, with proper load balancers, proper network equipment, uh, or running in the cloud, uh, you know, AWS or Azure. Uh, you don't try and run that across your laptop um, and then expect to get, you know, reproducible results. Um, so hopefully I'm, I'm preaching to convert it to, and this is all, uh, Fairly obvious, uh, but I just want to get my ducks in the way first. Um, and, you know, and again, just another mon mon mention of monitoring. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of ways that um, people traditionally build monitoring into their, their performance tests. Uh, a lot of these tools come with agents that you can put on all these boxes. Um, but my, my experience has been, um, you know, if you want to have a successful project and you want things to be uh, reproducible and lots of teams adopt the technology, um, it, it just works, the scale is much better if you're working collaboratively with SRE and DevOps and DEM teams um, and that you're all sharing a vision of what the monitoring should look like um, and then you just step on top of those tools. So you've got your logging coming essentially off, off of all the servers, so you've got our syslog, Elasticsearch running uh, and then you've got uh, Prometheus or Influx or something like that running to collect the, the metrics and the monitoring information. Um, and we we'll talk a bit about you know what you want to monitor, um, but I just want to mention you know um, you know there are options in the tools just to you know tick a box and have that information collected and presented alongside your load generator data, um, but that, that's not my recommendation. Um, I'm sure opinions are different on that, but it's just been my experience um, that you know as as a whole for the business it's much more successful if you you align your vision and collaborate on that front. Okay, so there's a number of things you're going to want to monitor. Uh, the obvious ones, uh, I find, you know, go to purpose, uh, you know, it's always quite obvious, you know, obviously you're going to want to, uh, you're going to want to monitor your limited hardware resources, you know, hardware, CPU, memory, uh, uh, a network capacity, bandwidth, 
um, errors, that sort of thing. Um, but what I find is it's a bit less obvious to people as you work up the stack. Um, so that's just sort of one level of monitoring. And there's a number of levels that you're going to want to get the coverage of. Um, so another one's the operating system. So there's going to be things like unlinked systems like union limits. So there's only a limited number of files and sockets you can have open. Um, if the kernel says no, so there's permissions you have to change. You can also get uh, gnarly issues with the, uh, the scheduling, memory swapping, things like that. Uh, all have to be monitored at the OS level. Um, but things, you know, things that are commonly forgotten about. Um, also, again, in you know, this day and age, uh, it's not so common to, to run on uh, production in on raw hardware. Um, so you are more likely got a container framework such as Docker, Kubernetes, ECS, um, or you've got uh, virtual machines uh, running. Um, so again, you're going to want to monitor, monitor those, those metrics as well, um, because there's, um, you know, even Docker, there's, there's limits um, on those shared resources and you'll start getting throttling. Um, and I think some really interesting problems with um, technology like VMware, where you really push your network hard, the VM looks really happy, but under the hood, uh, the, 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 the kernel for the virtualizer is working really hard and it's having to swap packets between different virtual machines and you get these really weird lag spikes. Um, so it's really important to, to keep an eye on what those things are doing. Um, so it, a level people often don't think about um, is the application stack. Um, so it's all very well that, you know, you've got memory um, and you've got CPU, but it doesn't guarantee that your application is performing well. Um, to understand, if you have a slowdown, to understand why it's happening, you also have to dig into garbage collection, thread pools, uh, and anyway, you've got locks, uh, limited resources, limited number of connections to another server, limited number of connections to a database, uh, all those sort of things. Um, it's important to have visibility of. Um, yeah, I'm working up a stack, uh, service level. Um, so it's all getting increasing importance now. Um, so there's this service level, I'm talking to things about what's happening, you know, almost at uh, a domain level through application. So how many requests to add to your shopping cart are you getting? Um, how, how many how many of those requests are failing? What's what's the latency of requests? So there's a few metaphors. Uh, there's there's a few um, do we call them um, metaphors people use for um, remembering these. Um, there's the, the Google four golden symbols uh, symbols signals four golden signals. Um, uh, I like uh, just the red rate error duration. I find it a bit easier to to to, to remember. Um, and it's also used in running threads is more about what is happening at the hardware level. Um, but yeah, make sure as well as knowing what's going on with hard, the hardware, you know that the application that requests are coming through successfully um, for each area of the application um, and that, 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 that useful work is occurring, so you're not just blasting on load and queuing up work. Um, make sure that the application is processing work and that you've got the same number of things in the queue at the end of the test as you did at the start. Um, and then finally, uh, there's the user level. Um, so this is data that you might not be able to get uh, in uh, in a performance test. Um, if you're if you're doing a website, uh, you might find that you're interacting with lots of JavaScript frameworks. There's lots of browser behavior. There's latency over the internet. So they're really important statistics, uh, really important metrics. Um, but you're likely only going to get them by um, once you go to production and having. Uh, having plugins into your your website to uh, uh, send those to an APM provider, um, so that you know you know what's happening in the real world, not just what's happening under test. Okay, so coming back to our story, um, so we're producing some honey. Uh, the bees are working away, and um, uh, we want to know you know we're, we're looking at what they're producing. So the obvious thing to do in this scenario is uh, obviously the bees are producing drops whoop, uh, and they're dropping honey over time. So the other thing to do is just to plot um, how much honey they, they uh, drop over an interval. So you're just sort of, you know, counting in one minute buckets and then counting, oh yeah, I've got five here and six, you know, six here. Whoop. Um, uh, and, you know, it's great. So you're basically measuring the rate of the farm there. So it's a service level metric. Uh, you're monitoring rate, 
um, you know, it's a good metric to have because you, you know you're hitting your, your target throughput. Um, but what it doesn't tell you is the detail of um, if there's a delay in the farm. It doesn't, doesn't give you enough information to understand why that delay is occurring and how you can optimize. Um, so performance tests were often looking at um, a scatter graph of response times. Um, so you're just measuring response times for your request, or in this case, the arrival rate of the bees. So the bees are arriving over time, um, and you're monitoring, you know, how many seconds since the last bee that occurred. And you know, that's analogous of the response times on a, on a web server. Um, and obviously, you know, when you're looking at uh, this type of graph, it's much more obvious now. Um, you can't see what the throughput is, but it's much more obvious where the outliers are. So here we've got one that took a lot longer. And then you can, you can drill into other, system, other metrics um, to understand um, why that delay might have occurred or um, you know, do some profiling work for them to work out why those delays occur. And, and often you see, see these happen in patterns. So there'd be one outlier here and there'd be another band here and there'd be another one here. Um, and you can start, you know, start the reason that there's a different type of request happening or the service page in memory or is doing garbage collection. Um, you can start to investigate. But the first thing to do, um, if the first thing to do if you're doing a, doing some manual analysis for data is you draw a scatter graph, and that's what you probably put in a report. If you've got a simple CI pipeline um, and it's just running a load generator um, off the shelf, it's going to um, collect some metrics, it's going to draw your scatter graph, and you're going to look at it and you're going to go, oh, there's the outliers. Um, uh, but of course, you know, that works great. Um, problem with that is um you know it's kind of hard to automate in terms of if you want to have automated acceptance criteria um so we're gonna to have to dig a bit deeper um still really useful to have though you know if you've got any problems um you get an automated result it goes to something wrong um it's still useful to have this data to, to go back and obviously you'd have this information for each metric that you're looking at you might have response times but you might also have it for um you know the hardware specs for cpu memory um service level metrics any, any queues things like that um, so, um, you know, another view you see all the time when you do manual reports is you've got your histogram. So here we just got buckets. So this is this response times again. So it's the same data as a previous graph. Um, but what we've done is we've taken all the responses that uh, were uh, under, say, two seconds, and we've counted them up and we put them in a block. And then once it's taken under four seconds, six seconds, eight seconds, and then 10 seconds and over. Um, and that's a really useful view, um, both for, um, you know, humans to, to process and go, oh, yeah, no, obviously, um, 90% of requests are under this time. Um, but you can also often you see bands, so you can see, oh, this request takes a really long time. And um, there's lots of requests for some reason. Most of them are fast, but for some reason, there's lots of them that are taking exactly 10 seconds. And then you can start to reason, oh, there's some retries going on and things like that. Um, so, again, really useful for humans. Um, but we're also starting to move towards what can be processed automatically so that we cannot just execute tests um, from, a, you know, from a, a pipeline perspective. We can't just run them and, you know, walk away and get, um, we can actually start to make a, you know, reasoning about whether it's a good test result um, uh, and whether, you know, whether we need to reject the build and uh, have developers look at it before making any more changes. Okay, so um, if you went to a substitution and you said, I've got this um, set of data, so I've got all these, these response times or these arrival rates um, over the duration of the test, um, and I want to compare one test result to another, so you've got two, dist you've got two distributions, um, what they would say to you is that we want to look at location, um, so where, where's the data? Uh, position sort of, you know, on the numerical scale. Um, so, you know, the ways you normally do that is that you take an average. So you've got an idea that the data is sort of averaged around this sort of point, and this is like the central location. Um, but they'd also suggest you look at the spread, um, which is the, the variation between each each data point. So obviously you run a test with thousands of results. Um, you know, you might average six seconds, but some of them will be around two seconds. Some of the outliers are, you know, 30 seconds, some are time out at five minutes or something ridiculous. Um, but majority of the, you know, for, for web test performance, you know, majority of the, you know, one or two seconds. Um, but it's going to be over a range, right? Um, sometimes people, you know, um, try and take the minimum 
and the maximum, and they go, oh, the maximum that ever was was this, was this number, um, and it's normally ridiculously high. Um, so it's normally just the maximum it can be, so, you know, it'd be five minutes or 30 seconds, um, where everything else is, you know, around one or two seconds. And um, they wonder why that's not a very repeatable test from one run to another, or one version to another. Um, and it's because there's random variation within a test, right? Um, there's, you know, based statistically, there's, there's things, just, just bad luck that can happen. And if you're running lots of samples, there's going to be some values that are really high just, just to, to natural variation. Um, there's also a lot of things going on with the operating system. Um, you know, there's, there's network queues, there's, you know, GT and stuff going on. Um, the point is, if you've got, you know, a million data points in your test and one of them is really high, um, it's not a very good metric to report on um, because not, not as in, not going to be reproducible because you can't compare the two tests. Um, it's not representative of what's really going on. Um, you know, um, you know, do you really want to stop a release to production that you know gives the you know ten times speed up for you know ninety nine point nine percent of the customers because one request took a really long time? You might want to look at it. You might want to investigate it. Um, but it's not a good metric for comparing results because you're too likely to get an outline. Uh, the other metric thing, uh, as a statistician would say, is look at the shape. Um, so a shape of distribution, they can be, uh, they can be uh, uniform, which means they can be, be flat, so they can all be around six seconds. Um, or you can have sort of Gaussian curve, so you've got like a, a normal curve where um, lots of around the average, but you know, um, some a little bit more than the average, but they sort of tail out as you get further away. Um, or what you normally see in performance tests is that most tests are fast and then there's a long tail. So you get sort of a bump over one side of a graph and then it tails off. I should have done a picture. Next time, next time. Um, so that's what I started to say. Um, when we come to be an engineers, um, we go, well, that's all very well, well and good, but actually um, they're not things necessarily we care about the test um, and also they're not things that are very actionable. Um, so what I was suggesting to you is that the most practical place to start, if you're not really sure where you're starting with this sort of thing, is just go for the obvious, go for, go for an average. Um, so it mean, means one, one, one measure of the, the, the average. Um, and the common thing to do is get a percentile. Um, so a percentile will um, give you an idea of what's sort of happening at the sort of a bad case. Um, but you're rejecting sort of the top little bit of traffic. And if you're not comfortable with 95%, go for 99%, you know, 99.99. Amazon used five nines. Um, but you just want to throw away that top little bit um, where they're really unusual requests. It's a minority of users. They probably just stop and redo the request anyway. So it's really a failed request, not, not a, you know, a long time at waiting. Um, but yeah, you need to do that to get your reproducibility. And also, you know, it does give a accurate reflection of what's going on in the real world. Um, really, really rare events. Um, I just can make your test, you know, I just make the test not very comparable. Um, and not, they don't give you useful feedback. Um, yeah, so go for the percentile and an average. Re really good place to start. Um, don't be getting really confused with a maximum minimum because it's just going to lead to um, bad things. Um, so I wanted to mention um, some other things that I've come across in my career. Um, so I don't know, yeah, I can't see the feedback. So I don't know how many you're familiar with something called AppDex. Um, you might have seen it if you use a commercial APM provider. Um, if you're really nerdy like me, um, or you've done a bit of performance consulting, you might have come across something called the mean confidence interval. Um, so mean confidence interval basically just means um, you're working out an error bar around the average um, using something clever called the central limit theorem. Um, don't worry about it too much. Um, AppDex, uh, again, is a compound uh, statistic, um, popularized in the APM world. It takes uh, something, it's something to do with the number of users were, that are sort of very happy compared to users that are super happy. Um, and it sort of multiplies the ABC when it on one, one metric rather than two. Um, I just think they're, you know, are just a little bit too. Uh, intellectually exclusive, I think it's just getting a bit too clever and it confuses people. So I would suggest you, you stick away from those um, unless you, you know, you're comfortable knowing what you're doing. Um, I just think it, it's just not good for communication to, to people outside, um, you know, people who haven't been involved in testing. 
um, and communicating to the business and developers and stuff. It's just unnecessarily technical jargon. Um, something else we should talk about where, you know, um, you're starting to want to compare uh, one test result to the next. Um, so uh, in a minute, I'll show you a graph and you get an idea. If you take the average or you take the centile um, and you compare them test to test, you're obviously going to end up with a sequence of test results, right? And you're going to want to compare one to another. Um, that obviously gives you a time series, um, like you would with a stock chart. You're going to have, you know, one result on Monday, another one on Tuesday, another one on Wednesday. Um, and the obvious thing to do is then use um, anomaly detection based on time series. Um, that can work. You know, I've, I've had some playing with that. It can work. Um, the drawback to it is, as well as being a little bit, you know, technical and complex, is that um, you need quite a lot of data points, so a lot of test runs before you can start detecting anomalies. Um, so that's fine if you if you want if you've got fairly quick tests um, and you can sort of, or you've got lots of time to wait and you can kick off, you know, thirty tests to create a baseline, um, or you can wait thirty builds before you start relying on the automated results because you can review them manually. Um, also, you need good training data, um, so you're going to want fairly consistent test runs. If you've got, if it's early in the project and it's a bit hit and miss and you've got lots of bad builds, um, doing any sort of anomaly detection like that early on is going to be uh, problematic and cause a lot of false positives and things missed. Um, but anyway, I mentioned it because it's an option. Um, uh, you can do it, um, but uh, not had great results with that. So uh, I'm going to show you what I've done on the most recent projects. Um, and yeah, we can we talk about that. Um, okay, so most recent projects, um, I've been looking at um, a way to compare one test one to another. Um, so as soon as you're human, you'd, you'd, you know, you'd have the baseline on the left and the, the, you know, the next result on the right, um, and you'd have the two graphs and histograms, and you go through each metric. Um, obviously, it doesn't sound too bad if you've just got the rate, but say if you've got 10 or 100 or 1,000 metrics that are really important because they're different, they're different functions or um, you know, the queues or the, you know, I don't know, back-end processing stuff, DB times, uh, connection pools. Um, so you've got thousands of metrics going by hand is really tedious, so you don't compare them by eye. So you need a way to compare them automatically. Um, a mean and percentile is a really good place to start, um, but what it doesn't tell you uh, is two things. It doesn't tell you if the distribution of results is in a different shape, so that you know, the percentiles are in a similar place. It's not very likely, but it can happen um, that, you know, there's, there's a really sh weird sh change in the distribution or something really odd going on, and you're just really unlucky, and the results are similar, um, but there's some anonymous stuff that you really want to look into that's not been detected. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is, uh, say, you've just got an average, um, and you've got another test result. Um, you've got really large test result, um, when you run a performance test, you get really large data sets. Um, so unlike the statistical world where they might do a car survey and they have a few hundred cars or a few thousand cars, they're likely to have thousands or tens of thousands of results. So you're gonna get a really high statistical confidence that that mean is correct. Um, you might be able to get a really strong confidence what the confidence interval is. Um, so the range of where the mean should sit if you re repeat the test. Um, what it doesn't tell you is um, when should you accept it? Um, so say that the test has increased a few um, a few percent. Um, do, you do, do you accept that? Do you reject that? Do you just have a uniform policy that if it's within 10% or within a 10, uh, 10 milliseconds that you accept it and you treat that as equivalent? Um, what do you do if that, you know, that um, slips over time and you just have a slow increase of a few hundred milliseconds each release, but over time it adds to seconds. Um, it can be tricky to know what to do with that. Um, so yeah, two problems there, so two solutions. Um, so equivalence testing is just something that's come out from the biopharmaceutics world. They've had the same problem. They, they were doing averages and uh, percentiles and looking at the um, confidence interval. And when you have two pharmaceutical products, they would test them with people, take it through blood, check the absorption is, uh, roughly equivalent for each one and they work out the statistical confidence and compare them and then sometimes they get really high statistical confidence that they are slightly different um, and they do all their clever statistical stuff no you know no hypothesis testing and all that sort of stuff that they need to worry about 
Um, so they all did smacky stuff and they come up with the idea, come up with conclusion. Um, yeah, you know, the, the math says it's different, um, but it's really similar. Um, but we don't really know what to do with it because we don't have a framework for pointing that. So they came up with equivalence testing, um, which is just a way of saying um, you define up front um, what is an acceptable range past the mean. Um, so you might, you know, again, you might do a fixed number or you might do a fixed percentage. Um, but it will take to account um, the variance and stuff in the test and the, the power within, well, sorry, the mathy term power. It would take, take to account how much data you've got and give you a, sort of some statistical confidence. Um, I hope that's clear enough um, about your test results. So, you know, it'll give you some, some, some mathy confidence that um, not just is the mean within 5%, um, but your, um, the, the, te the test wasn't, wasn't very variable and you can have some uh, confidence that scientifically that this result is equivalent to the other within a certain range. So I've explained that terribly, but you can, um, yeah, it's a useful approach to use and you can look it up on Wikipedia and stuff if you want more detail. Um, KS test, I won't try and, it's Russian, I won't try and pronounce the full name, um, but there you're looking at the distribution. Um, so you can take one result and another, um, and you, basically it's like looking at histograms and it will give you a score and a probability um, that one dis distribution is, is equivalent to the, to the other. Um, so, you know, it gives you a really good way to go, rather than looking at percentiles, it gives you really good confidence that the, all the percentiles, basically all the buckets, are similar to what they were before um, and you can define how much, uh, how fussy you want to be with that set. Um, so there's two sort of mappy things, um, but you don't really need to worry about what they are if you want to play with that stuff. Uh, all you really know, need to know is what, what, the, um, what the techniques are called. Um, you can Wikipedia them, you can download the Python library and to apply it yourself. Uh, you don't really need to worry too much about the math. Um, just get your data set and run it across. Um, the, the, the downside to these techniques is um, calculating percentiles and calculating KS score require a full data set. Um, so in a performance test environment, that's normally okay. So say if you've got a single load generator or you've got a couple, you can pull the metrics together. If you've got a test that collects all of all results like JMET, you collect a CSV, you can run that through a Python script, you can calculate uh, the percentile, it's really easy. Um, if you've got uh, a much larger test, you've got lots of load generators and lots of servers, uh, or you're using a distributed load testing tool um, like Locust, um, or some cloud tool, commercial tool, uh, you might find that it doesn't give you access to the raw metrics, so you can't do a scatter graph, so it's not a tool I'd recommend anyway, because you can't, it's not very easy to debug, um, but um, you also can't run a statistical testing on it. Um, it's also a problem if you're production, testing it, um, monitoring over production at scale. Um, so this is a problem that came across recently, the developers wanted to work out um, what their response time, what, <laughs> they want, they had an SLA that was the, you know, 95% um, responses were under two seconds of this service. Um, but we had a problem that the data was going through stats D, which means it was calculating an average and a max and a min, which again, you know, as I said, is not useful. Um, but there's this problem with percentiles that you can't aggregate them. So we could have told stats D, I'll collect a percentile, but it would have done it for a time bucket and you can't then re-aggregate those together. Does that make sense? So if, you, if you've only got uh, 95 percentile for several time buckets. Um, all you can do then is get the average of a 95th. You can't get the, the true 95th of the entire sample. Um, again, the problem's compounded if you've got mul multiple uh, host of reporting that you can't really aggregate that data if you don't have a raw data. Um, so a workaround for that that's worth knowing about is instead you can collect bins uh, or histograms. So basically you just count how many results that are over two seconds. Yeah, and how many are under one? Uh, under two, how many are under two seconds? How many are over? You calculate a ratio. You have got a percentage. Um, so then you're going to get a number. So you say you got ninety six percent. They've passed the SLA um, because it's over ninety five. Um, they don't know where they don't know where the ninety fifth percentile is, but they know they've met, met the SLA. So you can do the same thing um, for performance tests. And I think I've seen that in some commercial tools is that they give the option. You can define an SLA for the test. You can say to, to pass this test. Uh, 95 results, 95 percent results have to be under two seconds, um, and that gives you a red green for that individual test running. It doesn't compare them from one result to another, um, but it does give you a sort of unit test type confidence that an individual test uh, has met some quality 
markers. Okay. What else have we got to do? Trends. Yeah, so that's what we've been talking about. Um, so, um, so you've got your, got your averages or you've got, uh, yeah, you've got your averages or you've got your percentiles. doesn't matter which one you're looking at, you're going to get a graph every time. Um, so, you know, this is supposed to represent a box plot, which I don't know, you're hopefully you've all seen a box plot. Uh, if you haven't, don't worry about it. They could just be dots. But what we're really saying here is that there's an average in the middle of these two dots, and then there's uh, a range that the results appear within. Um, normally that's done with quartiles, but you could deal with the error bar as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what we're just saying is uh, visually, we can see if, if all we're doing is calculating an average in 95th percentile for the metric, Visually, you can say test to test to test to test um, that there's some increase or decrease. Um, and that's a really good place to start. If, you, if you're on, on this journey um, and you start, you know, you've managed to get your tests running in your CI pipeline, you've got your deployments working with Share for Puppet, whatever, um, and you can run your test and you, see, and you get a report. Um, the, ne the next step is to get a trend from test to test. Um, and then humans can really easily just look at results um and rather than have to drill into each report you can just go back at the end of the week and go i can see for every single commit that developers done um over the last week um which individual build um caused a massive regression um and that is so powerful the first time you put that in and it blows people's minds so rather than having to wait to the end of a project or the end of a week to get get a report um even if you don't have automatic alerting in you can look at those test results and you can tell them Oh yeah, it was commit, you know, four, five, six. I can see it because before that there was a low response time and now there's a really high response time. I can see, I can see that in the graph. So even if you're doing that retrospectively, um, it's really powerful. Um, this is something I have not really seen um, in any of the commercial tooling. Um, it is something you have to build, um, but you can do it really easily with Grafana. Um, so you know, sort of most of my projects, you don't get a perfect feel like this. You don't get little error bars, um, but what you can do is you can say, well, here's Here's, here's a, uh, a line, here's a series for the um, 95th percentile and here's the average and you can do a graph for each um, each metric that you're interested in um, and you'll get these weird gaps because if you, you know, I, I suppose if you run them over, if you run them at the same time every day, you'll get equal spacing. If you do it on a build, you might get these weird gaps. It looks a bit weird um, in Grafana, um, so it's not necessarily, it wouldn't look like this that you wouldn't get um, all the versions next to each other nice and tidily. You'd have to do a spoke tool for that. But on the flip side, um, you get some awareness of time as well. And sometimes time um, for, for understanding how a problem is introduced is actually really, really useful. You can see that you know, developers came back after bank holiday weekend and broke on the Monday. Um, and sometimes that's more useful to them than the revision number. And you can get an idea for, um, you know, in the last sprint for the last two weeks, it got really sloppy. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's clear. Um, how, how you'd go about uh, implementing that, if you wanted to do that yourself, is you know simply you, you're letting your you're running your test, you're letting the metrics collect in the central monitoring system, um, so Prometheus uh, or Influx. Data goes into there. You let the test. You run the test. Uh, you let the test finish. You just you just run a script that collects all those samples in one loop to scale or get the last hour's data. Or get um, or record the timestamp from the test start and one at the end, you know, and then get all that data for that range from from uh, for the metrics you're interested in from Prometheus, um, and then shove them back in the time series database. You can sort of do this with Prometheus, but it's a bit of a bit of a, uh, a stretch because it's sort of a push mechanism. Uh, it's a Prometheus uses a pull rather than a push mechanism. Um, I always used Influx, um, which is another time series database used in monitoring. Doesn't matter if they're not using that elsewhere. Uh, in your company, um, you can pull the data from Prometheus or from whatever system you're using, and you can push that all back into um, Influx and just use that for your, your test reporting. There's, there's no problem. Um, you know, you, you can use both tools. Um, and again, you can get that plotted up on graph file really easily. Um, and it's a really low cost solution for doing that. Um, and that's like I said, that's a really good place to start. Um, even if you if you then go the next stage and you put an, either put an omnitection in or you put in, um, decide that you're going to look at equivalent testing and the KS score. Um, so to use that, all you, all you do is um, you're going to have to either choose a baseline or decide to look at the previous test result. Um, the benefit of looking at the previous test result is that um, 
you're not going to have to keep recording the baseline. Baseline might just go stale. The downside is it can slide. Uh, over time, the results can sort of deteriorate. Um, but it's just a you know a decision you have to make in the team. Both both approaches work fine. Um, but if you if you if you're automatically updating that baseline, then you obviously have to keep an eye over time. But basically, you just record that baseline. Um, you calculate out the K score and the equivalence. Um, uh, uh, equivalence gone blank. <laughs> uh, you work out the equivalent score. Um, so you know if you run your t test, whatever you needed to run, um, and then. Uh, you, you just compare that against the test result you just ran and you just you just you know you can just do you know uh, ha have it run as a build termination a build failure if that fails or you can what, fire off an alert however you want to handle your process within your company um, but it's just that simple on each build you just you just compare the test result again and you can get 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 the result in your your CI system and reject the build um, so uh, getting short of time now so I think I've got timing just about right hopefully it's not been too rushed. Um, in true trendy American presentation style, um, I have suggestions and takeaways for you. Um, so hopefully I've communicated this in presentation. Um, this is what I really like you to take away from it is that um, make sure that you've got a suitable test environment um, and that, you, you're, that your load generators and your system under test are independent. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but a really terrible thing I've seen, there's always a laptop thing, another crazy thing I've seen, also VMs, you know, people love to run on VMs, don't run on your VMs, have a proper spec for, for, your, for your test box. Um, another thing I've seen is conflation of the test environment and performance tests. They run performance tests on the, on the system under test. Um, I, I don't know why, I guess it was convenient. They had, had the system under test, it seemed over spec, so they run the test in the same box. So it sort of had capacity, but then you, you've completely lost any sense of sort of network separation, but you've also um, made it really hard to pull apart and monitor what the application is doing and what the load generator is doing. It's like, does each tool have enough capacity? Do they have enough resources? Um, is one impacting the other? Um, if there's a slowdown, which, you know, which tool is at fault? Um, it just makes it really difficult. And obviously that's not how you run a production, so don't test like that. Um, choose your K KPIs really carefully. Um, so make sure you look at those application level and the service level metrics. Um, uh, have, a bit, have a bit of a Google or reach out to me if you want to know a bit more about that and how to choose those. Um, and then make sure you apply the white SLAs to it when you, you're not looking at the maximum min, um, but instead you're looking at the average and the percentiles on another suitable metric. Uh, make sure you, you've, you're, it's a DevOps generation, so make sure you're leveraging your CI pipeline. Um, don't be waiting to the end of the day and clicking a button on your laptop to run the test and then generating the result in a spreadsheet like we did back in the old days. Make sure it's part of your pipeline, it's automated, um, it, that you perform the test, deploy and run um, after the software is built and unit tests have passed. Um, again, yeah, uh, you know, try and I know it's difficult because you're constrained by what your business is doing, um, but wherever possible, work with business. If you've got a DevOps team, an S3 team, work with them, make sure you're using the same technologies, um, contribute to the container definitions, to the Puppet scripts, make sure you all get involved in that, um, and that you're using those same tools across development and in performance testing. Um, don't have each team try and resolve that problem for themselves, because you're just working against each other, you're duplicating efforts, um, you know, have a, have a word with your, um, you know, you develop manager, QA manager, go, oh, look, no, we need to have a uniformed approach to, to, to automation and deploying the software. Um, you know, bash in against it so far, power sharing against so far. We need to start looking at the tools that, you know, the big players are using that is going to make, make this more efficient and uh, more maintainable. Uh, I, and remember about SOE. Um, so, uh, gone are the days of dropping an agent on the machine. I was having this argument with, with a commercial supplier on LinkedIn last, uh, last night. Um, and they're like, oh, use our commercial tool. If you want to use a commercial tool for your load generation, uh, I'm not going to stop you. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary. I, I guess it depends on what project you're working on. Um, but I've already talked about tooling too much. I mentioned a few. I can go into a bit more detail if you want to get started on this and just not get your hands on. Um, but I tried to be a bit tool independent and just sort of outline some, some approaches. Um, but definitely do, don't just focus on load generation tools and load generation uh, you know, data collection plugins. Also look at, you know, holistically at your entire development stack 
um, ask teams what they're using for monitoring the production, going, oh, you know, in operations using Prometheus, come and get involved on that. Developers are publishing metrics to StatsD. How do we pull that into performance tests so they get richer information um, and you can get more value out of performance tests, spot more problems, um, and might work faster. Okay, so we're coming up to 45 minutes. I've uh, waffled long enough. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, some parts. Hopefully it's been interesting. Um, uh, I've put, uh, so we'll go over to slide, I don't know how you pronounce that, is it slide do or slide, yeah, we'll go over to the, the questions uh, momentarily. I don't know if Ashley wants to say anything before we move over. Um, I'll give them a moment, otherwise I'll just move over. Um, but hopefully put some questions in and I'll, I'll go through them. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully I got, got the level right. It's very difficult when you're uh, unfamiliar audience about whether it's too technical or not technical enough. Um, like I said, I've skipped over the tooling, um, but we'll come back to that um, and I can provide some sort of follow-up information if that's the sort of level people are interested in or I can do a talk in future and we can introduce to Jamie to whatever. Uh, yeah, go ahead, actually. Yeah, no worries. I think the best thing to do is obviously ha let's have a quick look out see if there are any questions coming in. Um, I guess best to get those answered whilst they're, uh, whilst they're coming through. Um, and then, yeah, we can obviously wrap things up from there. So let's, uh, let's see what's coming through from your side. Okay. We've got, we've got a few. Okay. Um, so I'm guessing, yeah, we've got, we've got plenty of time, right? So I'll go through them. I thought it was going to, um, it's going to rank me. So I asked rank them. Okay. Yeah. So I've done. Uh, so a few people said Kathleen or Jamie to, is that a valid, valid question? Uh, I use Jamie to a lot. Uh, I've also mentioned Locus, uh, Gatling, uh, you know, come across it, I haven't used it very heavily myself. Um, I'm not, yeah, to be honest, I'm not, yeah, not familiar enough Gatling to be, uh, to be commenting. Uh, no idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, open source tools, absolutely love. Um, I think if you're just doing some HTTP stuff, um, there's lots of tools out there that are very valid. Um, the only thing I say, yeah, make sure something that, that you can work with that developers can maintain works well with source control management. Um, you know, uh, it meets, meets, meets flexibility for business, so you don't have to keep buying more user licenses and you're not constrained by that. Different developers can edit it. Um, but yeah, there's lots of really good open source options. If you're doing complex data analysis, um, it's really useful to have a raw results. There's been this horrible trend where um, you can't get those raw results anymore. And I understand why they want to do that for a, um, you know, for, for distribution and making the development easier. Um, but it means once you run your test, it's not really any good raw data to, 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 you know, to troubleshoot, to understand what's gone wrong, uh, or even find those problems in the first place. Um, so I think Gatling probably does that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not certain. I'd have to look into that. Okay. Next question. Who decides on base load and acceptable values under load? Team, product owner, per fringe, finger in the air. Okay. Uh, acceptable values. Okay. So that's a complex question, I guess. Um, so I've done it all those ways. All those ways. Um, so ideally, you'd get an idea, you know, if your organization is structured that you've got someone representing the business or a product owner, um, hopefully you can, as a QA person and as an engineering team can work with them. Um, so most of the answers are going to say like, you know, it's, it's collaborative because um, the product, the, the, hopefully the product owner has an idea what the business requirements are, um, who the customers are, um, what the requirement is to, to keep, keep those customers happy. Uh, as an engineering team, you have to bear in mind um, the engineering restrictions, um, what's practical, how do you scale this thing up? Um, you know, bear in mind how complex the domain is and, you know, what you're doing. Web pages are going to take load, longer to load than an API. You know, some APIs are really light. Others are doing lots of data processing under the hood, access to database. It depends on what they're doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, often it's a combination of all those things. Um, you know, talk to your product owners, uh, talk to, you know, your, your management, talk to your team, um, hopefully come up with some standards. Um, so where I work currently, um, we do telephony and we have uh, uh, guidelines set for because they're producing hundreds of microservices. Um, we don't go individually in and set requirements. We set requirements saying, well, if it's a, if it's a voice interaction, then, you know, it's got a four nines SLA. If it's um, an administrative one, it's got a three nines SLA and 
um, things like that. So we just have guidelines across the business. But uh, there's, there's no easy answer, I'm afraid. You just have to um, you just have to use common sense and however you you know make decisions with your company normally. Um, oh, it's moved. Any tips for free server under test to run our own scripts against, or just Docker or Home Lab? Um, I used to have one. Um, it's shut down now. Um, when I've so what they're basically saying is they want, they want a test system um, they can do requests against. Um, yeah, so you can just put something in S3 and put a cache in front of it. Um, I'm not aware of any services running currently. Sometimes people put them up for the tools. Um, but what I would say, you know, wrong you on Docker works well. Depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to understand how to use a tool, you don't really need to slam a system. People like to develop a, you know, learn a tool jet load scale up to hundreds of users thousands of users and really slam a server um you don't need to do that if you're just learning um we just have any scripts just just use the you know what one to five users often commercial tools have free licenses for five users um commercial servers will often provide a, a target as well to test against um some of the functional providers like postman provide a, a service to test against uh or if i'm running at low scale i'll just use one of some like HTTP bin where you can see the HTTP requests you made um you could just use that um, but if you're running over low load, you can use anything. No one's really going to mind if you hit their website really low load. Um, but uh, yeah, if you if you if you wanted to slam it, um, then I suggest you use a performance server within your you know your own organisation or for home or spin up a Docker. If if you're looking to start to understand the performance characteristics of a server, um, so why you know um, how a server performs when it's under load how latency increases, how garbage collection starts to affect the test results, um, then yeah, Docker VM uh, locally is perfect. Um, just bear in mind it's the local application and it's not gonna scale the same as some production, um, but you can start to experiment with um, different scenarios go, that can go wrong. Um, and we do that for our S3 interviews. we have a number of applications that have common problems and we we'll ask people to debug them. Um, which is, you know, again, really valuable for um, um, performance testers. I did that when I did Jimmy to training internally, um, that we had some uh, Docker machines that they could load test against, and it just showed common problems like chip garbage collection. And you can you know, discuss those problems that with people understand what that looks like. Um, but yeah, if it's demand, I can, you know, look into that and, um, uh, you know, share some resources or even produce some Docker machines or republish that site. Um, but it doesn't come out that often. Just yeah, I'll just, just keep the load, load low and use something like HTTP bin or the Postman product. Uh, okay, so these are moving, which isn't helping, but I'll try and work out what's next. Um, what do I think of artillery? Um, again, there's a lot of tools out there. Uh, uh, I'm not in performance testing anymore, so I think I think you know keep keeping that to look at what's all going on. For me, Jamie is the general job generally for most products I worked up, or the alternative. Um, uh, for some projects where you're working with applications. Um, so I did a lot of work for uh, remote desktops, video clients, you know, sort of uh, fat clients for mobile, um, where this complex application side logic going on. Um, and actually, you know, back then we you know, were looking at things like Grinder was the trendy one back then. Um, I suggest you look at, you know, try them yourself or look at reviews online. Um, uh, you know, as long as it's something that, that works for you as a bit as a team, um, has good source control management, uh, doesn't constrain you because you can run it in source control. I don't really mind. Uh, I don't really care. Um, I let the developers use whatever they want within reason. Um, often, if we're doing complex applications, I've had to write a lot of my own performance tools um, or load, or the developers write load generation clients um, because. Um, if, you, if you're doing, doing some complex application behavior or using something like um, uh, one of the uh, Google photo buffs, um, the advantage of using an off the shelf framework with the meshes, then you can use something like Grindr and it lets you customize it um, or you can customize it with scripting. Um, but eventually, you just work out you're just generating load and collecting the metric, and actually, any script, Python, Java can do that fine, especially now that you've moved the monitoring. To, to the develop stack. Um, so as long as, you, as long as you can verify that you're hitting your performance targets and you're generating the load in a, a accurate way to represent what you need to troubleshoot in production, 
um, then yeah, you can use any tool. Um, not too worried about that. But yeah, um, yeah, just just have yeah, just have a play and see see what works for you and your team. Um, okay, we do one do one more, and then I'll check in with Ashley. For learners, any good online courses you recommend to take? Um, it depends what it depends what you're looking at. If if you're just looking to look into getting performance testing, um, Blaze Meter is a commercial JMeter provider. They've got some courses on how to use JMeter. Uh, there's lots of videos on YouTube how to use JMeter. Um, or we, we provide some training down the line. If you're talking about automation and integrating a pipeline, then no, I'm not aware of any. I'm not aware of anybody else who's doing it in a similar way to me. Um, so it'd be really interesting in feedback on that to see if it was something of interest or something you've come across yourself. Um, I'm not really aware of anyone doing it. Um, there's lots of commercial providers as well, near Load, Load Runner, um, and they've got uh, you know resources for their tools. Um, there's a book, uh, Performance Testing Web Applications by Microsoft, uh, that I recommend. Uh, there's some other ones, um, application performance testing and stuff. Um, just have a look on Amazon. The Microsoft one's very really good. It's getting a little bit old now, but it's published free online, so you can get a free ebook. Um, but if you want sort of introduction to performance testing, I'll probably start with a book. Uh, so at Microsoft uh, Web Applications, we can put a link. Uh, I did have a link for resources at one point. I've lost it, um, but uh, we, we can publish that somewhere online. Uh, okay. Oh, well, that's an interesting. Let's do one. Uh, how we have time for Ashley? We'll do a couple more. Yeah, we're okay. Yeah, I think clear off those last two on there. I think you've got, um, and then we should be. Uh, yeah, we should be done. I think there's a couple on there. So yeah, if you clear those off. Okay. So APM versus performance testing. Do you need both? Yeah, you need both. <laughs> um, so, uh, a yeah. So performance testing definitely changed. I think all testing's changed um, now that you know we're just in this agile world um, where we're developing applications really fast. We're releasing early. Um, we're updating applications regularly not just you know a big bang release um so you know apm is really valuable if you've got applications in production at any sort of scale and any sort of complexity to understand what's what's going on with them um you certainly want to monitor applications in production as much as you can um apm is unfortunately very expensive um but it's, it certainly adds value um so yes you certainly want that uh you still need performance testing um because performance testing is like any other sort of testing, you're gonna catch problems earlier. You can catch them before they go to production. Um, you can generate scenarios um, that are uh, not very regular in production. So you can know they're still working before that event happens. Um, uh, you, can you can test at loads that uh, you know the application needs support, but, the but before production isn't running very regularly. Um, you know, uh, working telephony, we get slammed when there's a, you know, a bank holiday or a Super Bowl event. Um, and we need every system we can do that. We can't just go once a year, always going to be really high load and use production to do that testing. And to, we need to know that the components of the stack can, can do that um, and it will scale up without a problem. Um, so yeah, I would very, yeah, very strongly suggest you have both. Uh, APM, I say, um, it's different characteristics APM. So when I think of APM, I think new you know, Dynatrace, so I think of, um, uh, uh, looking in your egg and thinking of looking at requests and understanding um, how much time is spent in those requests, how much time is spent in the database, how much is spent in different types of the codes. It's almost like a live profile. Other people mean, you know, real user metrics, understanding browser metrics. They're all very valuable. Um, basically, I look at your business, you know, I just look at your need, you, 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 your, um, your team and your budget. Um, all, you know, all these things, you can sort of do them without them if you, if you want a budget, um, but when you're running at a certain scale or certain complexity, um, these tools start to deliver return on investment and save you money on time and, um, you know, happy customers. Um, but yeah, definitely both if you can. Uh, all metrics in one place. Are there any benefits, better tools apart from Grafana and FluxDB? As there's a lot of config needs, uh, needs to going out there and not all DevOps are handy always. Um, okay. Um, no, so I've mentioned Grafana and I've mentioned Influx and I've mentioned Prometheus. Um, no, I think they're the leaders. <laughs> um, you know, back in the day, you know, you'd have Nagios and you'd have um, uh, for 
doing system monitoring, but it doesn't really do the application metrics. Um, and you know, you'd have that's the graphite RDD. Um, but yeah, I think the, the day's gone really, to be honest with you. Um, but sort of my point is looking at what makes a company an engineering team successful. It's not about performance testing and isolation. So yeah, I appreciate the DevOps guys are really, really busy. Um, that's not an uncommon occurrence. Um, the point is you're not supposed to be, you're not creating work for them because you're not going, oh, we need, we need monitoring here in, uh, in, in the test environment. Um, so we need to work out how to define, how to work, how to deploy influx and remove this. The point is, is if you're running microservices, uh, you know, in production, you should have a pipeline, you should have monitoring in every environment. You should have them in production, you should have them in test, you should have them in dev. Um, and you should have the ability to spin those up with automa automatically. So it shouldn't be a big cost. If you've already got those things in production, but you don't have the ability to build an exchange environment, or people aren't prioritizing exchange environment, then yeah, you really need to have a word with you know your, your QA manager and uh, your dev manager and go, look, no, um, you did, you, we, we, we need to invest in QA environment. Um, you know, I'd go further than saying have monitor tools. I'd say have the APM tools in your staging, in your performance environments, have all your security stack in there as well. So, you know, they're not causing problems. Have everything, you know, as soon as you can, can to production, I'm sending this back, possibly scaled down to a smaller size cluster. Um, but yeah, it's just about, you know, priority and making those business cases going well, you know, if, if you want to get accurate feedback, you want to prevent problems in production, then we just need to find a little bit of DevOps time to help us set that up. Um, or, you know, learn your skills yourself to, to be able to feed that back in. I think it's about going both ways, you know, I think, you know, if you go make a little bit of effort to understand how the deployment pipelines work and how, um, you know, the, the, the automation tools work, it goes a long way and people will help you go the rest of the way. Um, hopefully it answers that. Uh, <laughs> we ignore troll, yeah, okay. Um, Okay, like BDD, why could we not think like PDD, performance driven? Uh, is it a thing? Uh, I'd love, love for it to be a thing. Um, you know, performance is a more critical non functional barrier for some teams than others. Um, some other non functional things, obviously, security and reliability. Um, yeah, absolutely. Some teams' performance is a really big priority. Um, they're running at scale or they're performance critical or they're a core part of the application. And I do see them um, thinking about performance and testing really early. Um, so absolutely would say in this day and age, I've always said to, 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 to engineering teams, um, it's better to test early than to, to try and create a perfect test late. So, you know, test as well as you can, as early as you can. Do you have a suitable environment, but yeah, test as early as you can. Don't worry about having really wide test coverage. Um, performance test is about getting the hotspots of the application, the, uh, the critical paths and the highly accessed paths. It's not about getting wide coverage, um, but get that in as early as possible, iterate on it. Uh, don't think, you know, be afraid to fail early, get those tests running in pipeline and start making those improvements. Um, so yeah, I absolutely think it is a thing and I hopefully um, that will spread and you see it more and more. So yeah, yeah, I love that idea. Um, okay, I think we're there. Um, so again, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, if you've got any follow-up questions, you know, do feel free to, to ping me on LinkedIn. Um, if there's a particular demand for a subject, then yeah, maybe I can come back at a later date and uh, address that. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that, Matt. Um, yeah, really good talk there. I think really insightful and got a good amount of questions at the end. In the end, I know uh, Troll was responsible for a lot of those, but, uh, but yeah, no, thanks for uh, thanks for taking time out of your evening this tonight. Um, like we say, um, this will be a weekly occurrence, so we're, we're going to host these meetups um, every Thursday now going forwards. If there's anyone out there that does want to speak at future events or has any topics they'd like to hear about, please reach out to myself. Any questions on tonight's uh, talk, feel free to reach out to me or Matt directly. Um, also, this will be going on our YouTube over the next few days as well. So uh, keep an eye out if you need to watch anything back from there. Um, if not, I'll be in touch with you all soon. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you. Take care.